This is the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast, brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. We interview industry experts to unlock key information that will help young professionals break into the multifamily world in order to create long-term and short-term wealth. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and written review so we can reach more listeners. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. I'm your host, John Stober, with my co-host, Fritz Ritter. Today, our guest is Mauricio Raul. Known as one of the few lawyers that actually speaks English, Mauricio is one of the premier syndication attorneys in the country, helping real estate syndicators raise hundreds of millions of dollars to pursue their dreams of financial independence. He is the founder and CEO of Premier Law Group and spends 100% of his practice on syndications for real estate investors. With almost 20 years of securities experience, Mauricio specializes in Reg D offerings and educates investors from around the world how to navigate the complex world of financial securities. Mauricio Raul, thank you so much for joining us today on the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. So you are an SEC attorney. Could you just give everyone a quick overview of what exactly it is that an SEC attorney does? Yeah, that's code word for a syndication lawyer, to be honest with you. I mean, what I do is I help uh, real estate investors primarily, but really help people raise money legally. I mean, anytime you start raising money from people, um, you've got a whole bunch of regulations and compliance, uh, both at the federal and state level that you got to make sure you comply with. And that's my job. Make sure that you're raising the money legally and, and in full compliance with the law. Okay. So let's, let's dive into that. I don't think everyone is aware that you can raise money illegally. So what are the, what are the don'ts of raising money? So that way you don't get in trouble with the SEC. It's probably the other way around. It's, it's probably you, you can't raise money uh, unless you do it legally, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, that's one of the, the, big, the biggest issues I think I see a lot out there, especially when people aren't typically raising money, but they, they just decide to raise money at, at a given time, is they don't realize that they are really selling securities. That's why the SEC is involved in the first place. Like, you know, because a lot of people, especially if you're a real estate investor, you just want to go buy a, you know, a single family home or you want to go buy something and you want to get three or four of your buddies together to go raise, you know, pull your resources and then go buy this property. Like, why is the SEC involved? Like, why do I even have to worry about all this compliance nonsense? I'm just, I'm buying a piece of property, right? Um, and what you have to understand is like anytime you're taking money from people where the returns are generated by your efforts, in other words, anytime you take money from passive investors and then you're doing all the work, you're the active person, you are actually issuing securities, which is why you have to comply with all the, the, the securities laws. Um, and the, it, the securities laws are long, complicated, uh, and all that fun stuff. And some of them require you to actually register with the SEC, which is the last thing you want to do, but sometimes it's required. And so um, it's just a whole long, long list of things that we have to make sure that we comply before you're even allowed to go raise money. So if I'm going to go buy a single family home and do a renovation and I take out a hard money loan, technically, do I need to register with the SEC? Look, we, look once you realize that you're issuing securities, I kind of joke a little bit. You say, look, you have to either register it with the, with the SEC or you have to find an exemption, right? Or it's illegal. That's my third thing. But, you know, in general, you always want to avoid registration. So my answer to that is you, if you do it right, you will not be registering your security with the SEC. If you're buying a, a fix and flip or whatever in your example, you're not going to end up registering that with the SEC. But we have to find an exemption to registration. So we can't just go out and do it. We have to fit in. We have to find an exemption in order to alleviate our responsibilities of having to register it. And there's a bunch of different exemptions. And I think in your particular example, for example, the fix and flippers, and I don't represent a ton of them, but most of the time, for example, uh, those uh, are, are less than nine months. Typically, you buy a single family home, you fix it up a little bit, and you, you, you're ideally out of it in three or four months. You really don't want to be holding that too long. And so, you know, if you get a loan from someone 
that's less than nine months, for example, that would be by definition not a security. So that would be one exemption that we could look at. Or maybe it's a loan that's secured by the piece of property. It's secured by a mortgage. That's also most likely not going to be, it's a security, but it's exempt. Uh, and so it's just, it's all facts and circumstances. And, and, and in, in general, we just look at your fact pattern and we try and find out what's the best exemption because we know we don't want to register it. So what's the best exemption? And that's my, that's my role is to, is to let everybody know what your options are in terms of what exemption we should pick. So I know of three exemptions, 506B, 506C, and Regulation A. I don't know all the details of all of those exemptions, though. Could you explain to us what they are? Yeah, yeah those are probably the three most common. In fact, I would, I would argue B and C, the first two you mentioned, are probably 95% of the people will use those. So let's talk about those first, and then we'll talk about Reg A, which really has kind of taken off over the last uh, three to five years and wasn't as popular a while ago, but now it is, and there's specific reasons. But 506B and 506C are two exemptions to registration. So going back to our general rule, we either have to register or find an exemption. These are the most popular, and the reason they're popular is number one, there's what's called safe harbors, which means if you comply with the five or six items of these exemptions, we're assured that we're in compliance, which is what we want. We want to make sure we're not doing it wrong. So if we, if we follow these rules, we're good, which is, which is, which is a, it's a huge deal because we get certainty. The other reason it's so popular is, it, is all three of them that you mentioned, by the way, preempt state law, which means we don't have to worry about each individual state because a lot of people raise money from multiple investors from multiple states. So if we didn't have this preemption, um, uh, factor into it, we would have to literally go to California or Texas or Florida and all the different states. And you may, you might be in five to 10 different states. You'd have to go hire a lawyer in every single state, pay that lawyer to make sure you're complying with that state specific rule. And as you know, the state's rules may even conflict with each other. So it just becomes a nightmare. So that's why the preemption is so popular. And before, what was it? 2013, we only had 506B. In fact, it was only called 506. And 506B was cool because number one, we could raise an unlimited amount of money, which is a big deal for, for, for many. Um, it's one of the reasons why the huge, you know, the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgan, the, you know, all these huge firms actually use 506B because they can raise a billion dollars or $20 billion or whatever they want to do. So unlimited amount of money is very popular. Number two, you can accept some of your buddies, your friends and family who aren't high net worth individuals, people who are non-accredited, and I'll give you a definition in a second, but anybody who's non-accredited, you can actually take them into your deal, which is kind of a nice thing. So you can accept up to 35 non-accredited investors, which essentially are people who don't have a million dollars in net worth, excluding the residents, or earn less than $200,000 a year at least the last couple of years with a reasonable expectation of earning that. So if you're just starting, give your example, you've got your buddies and Johnny over here, there's a good chance that Johnny is not going to be accredited. And so 506B is very helpful in that scenario. Now, the, the, the bad thing about 506B or the, the limitation of 506B is we can't advertise. Like we can't just offer this, this opportunity to the world. We can't go on Facebook. We can't go on podcasts like this. We can't take out ads in the newspaper or run TV ads. We literally have to be a private offering with just our friends and family and people. We already have a pre-existing substantive relationship with them because it's a private offering. And that's over the years has been the main limitation. But those are kind of the three biggest things involving a 506B is unlimited raise. You can take up to 35 non-accredited investors, which is nice, uh, but you cannot advertise and you cannot solicit. And so with that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you mentioned that you, have, you can raise an unlimited amount for 506B. Does 506C mean you can't have an unlimited amount you can raise? No, let's, let's switch over to 506C. So 506C, if we had a little chart and we can put it next to each other, they would almost be identical. You could also raise an unlimited amount of money. And okay. the other less important factors we didn't go through are basically the same. The main difference, and I would argue, well, there's really two differences, but the main difference is the advertising. So what happened with 506C is that they introduced the ability to advertise without really calling it public, even though that doesn't really make sense because you're, you're advertising. So it's kind of a public offering, but it's technically not a public offering. It's a private offering that you get to, to do to the public. But you're allowed to advertise, which is great. Right now you can go on podcast. I can, I can come on your podcast and tell the world, hey, I've got a deal that I'm raising money for. Call me. I want to offer it to you or email me and I'll send you my, my brochure. You can literally do whatever you want. Well, 
I'm a lawyer. I shouldn't say you can do any white, but you know, you can go on Facebook. <laughs> you can go, you can post it on your website, which is you know, all these amazing things. I always joke, you want to take out an ad in the Super Bowl, knock yourself out, right? That's, that's the good news. The bad news is because of that, that, that allowance, they are going to limit you to only accredited investors. So now your buddy Johnny or your aunt Jenny or whoever who is not accredited would not be eligible to invest. And that's the limitation we have. And in addition to that, we can't really take, we can't take the investor's word for, for it. We can't just, if the investor tells me they're accredited, I can't rely on that representation. I actually have to take what's called reasonable steps to verify that they are accredited. So with the 506B, we just send out a questionnaire, they check the box, they tell us they're accredited or not accredited, that's all we need, we put that in our file, we're good. With the 506C, we've gotta start looking at tax returns, uh, you know, maybe get a letter from their CPA verifying stuff. So it's a little bit more due diligence to find out whether they're accredited, because that's really what the SEC wanted to control. They allowed us to advertise, but as kind of a, a hedge, they just wanted us to limit it to accredited investors all. So, I, this is a specific question. Let's say I have a deal and I've done a 506C and I've been advertising on this podcast and all over Facebook and social media. And then I find another deal and I decide to do a 506B. Am I even allowed to do that because I advertised a previous deal? It's, it's possible. The, the, the main thing with that, this is actually a topic I don't really get into that often. So this is a great, so thank you for letting me uh, explore this, this topic. Um, there's something called integration, which is just a, it's a fancy way of saying that the SEC can take both of your offerings. You said you were going to do a 506C and then we do a second one. It's a 506B and they may combine them and count them as one. They may integrate those two offerings into one. And the idea behind it is, uh, think of it this way. Let's say you're doing a 506B and you, you have 35 non-accredited investors. So that's the maximum you're allowed to do. You obviously can't just shut that one down, open up a brand new offering and start the 35 again. That's kind of a way around the rules. The XST on that one would clearly integrate those and you would be in violation of the rules. Um, there's a couple of safe harbors. We like safe harbors. Again, that's certainty. So the easiest safe harbor is the time between the offering number one ends and the offering number two begins. If that's a six month, win six month window, then they will not be integrated. So you can go out and do a 506 C deal in your example, raise a bunch of money, advertise, do whatever you want, close that deal, wait six months, do the next deal, and then you can do whatever 506 B, you know, whatever other exemption you can rely on. So that's the most common way. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of other factors. That's not the only way. There's other ways we can, we can make them different enough where as long as this offering is completely different from this other offering, we, we can do both of them at the same time or one after the other, if they're legitimately different. If it's just the same deal that you're trying to play games with and you're trying to use both exemptions, that's going to be a problem. But, but if they're completely different deals and there's like a five test factor test, depending on the type of deal it is, as these factors that you look at, um, it is possible to, to, to do two separate offerings using two different exemptions if they're different deals. And real quick, what's the definition of an accredited investor? The ones for our purposes are usually for the individual. So any individual that has a million dollars in net worth, excluding their primary residence. And the reason that came about is because I live in California and back in the, before this rule came out, everybody was accredited in California because their property values went through the roof back in you know, 2004, five, six, seven before the crash. So everybody was accredited. So they added that not too long ago where they exclude your primary residence, but essentially it's a million bucks in net worth or on the income side, if you've earned $200,000 a year the last two years with a reasonable expectation of earning that much this year, you're also going to be accredited. And if you're combined, if you're married, basically with, with your spouse's income, that number goes up to 300000 Okay. And then so what's Reg A? So there's actually two, the, the Reg A is actually divided into two, tier one and tier two, which most of us call Reg A and Reg A plus. And I think what you're talking about is really Reg A plus because Reg A is the old Reg A that nobody really used because it primarily didn't preempt state law. So we have these issues of having to, to go to every single state. So not too many people used Reg A back in the day, but Reg A plus is exciting because it allows you to have your cake and eat it too. It allows you to advertise just like a 506 C but it also allows you to take non-accredited investors, which is great. It's like you can advertise and you can take non-accredited investors. Now, there's some limitations. You can only take up to 10% of their income or net worth, right? Whatever is highest. But you can literally advertise and take non-accredited. That's really exciting. The reason it's not 
why everybody shouldn't jump on it and say, well, why would you ever do anything else? Because if, if that's all I told you, you'd be like, well, come on, let's just do a reg A plus. Like, why would I mess around with these other ones? The reason it messes around is it's, it's you actually have to kind of semi-register with the SEC, which before we, we said we never want to do a registration. This is called a mini IPO, meaning you, you it's, there's a registration process. It's not as intense as if you were going to go public, but you do have to get the permission of the SEC. And there's about a six month ramp up time. So if you wanted to start today, you would start the process and your deal would not get approved to be used in another six months. And so if you're buying a piece of property, for example, and you've identified a property, you're in contract and you've got to close in 90 days or 120 days, you don't have time to do a reg A, right? You don't have time to go go through the process, go argue with the SEC lawyers and, and, and make revisions and go back and forth for the next six months until it gets approved. You just don't have time for that. So it really only works in my mind, if you're doing sort of a fund, right? If you're gonna to put together a fund and there's no timeline and you can wait six months and you have the luxury of time, then Reg A is definitely something you wanna look at. Uh, it does take six months plus, it does cost a lot more money. It's probably three to four times more expensive on the legal side, just because again, now instead of just drafting docs and figuring it out and being done, you now have to submit those to the SEC and, and negotiate with the SEC back and forth. And there'll be several rounds four or five, six rounds of back and forth on the, on the submittal. Uh, and then there's compliance costs. So uh, not quite as onerous as, as public companies, but there's gonna be annual reports and semi-annual reports and audited financials and quarterly reports and entry reports and exit report. I mean, like, there's a lot of compliance involved. So there's just a higher cost. So that's one of the reasons if you're gonna do Reg A, I would, I would try and make that fund as big as possible. You can't raise an unlimited amount. Your cap's at 50 million which for most of us I think is fine. But uh, if I was gonna do a reggae, I would probably just, just might as well do it for 50 million since you're gonna probably spend, you know, probably somewhere around 60 to 70 to $80,000 all in between legal fees and compliance costs um, in doing one of those. So you might as well raise a, a significant amount of money. Otherwise it just doesn't make any sense. Awesome. So you mentioned earlier that there's legal ways to make money and there's or legal ways to raise money and illegal ways to raise money. Yeah. What are you seeing is the most common way for investors who are like, how are people illegally raising money right now? Because I know it's happening a lot in the space. It's happened a lot, but the top, I always come up with the top three, but let, let's do the main one. The main one by far, I think is, well, it's a tie. Let's do the two. One of them is just at using social media, Facebook and social media and podcasts and websites. Cause remember websites are public all those mediums in order to do a 506B. Uh, for some reason, there, there's been a, a misconnection and, and even though 506B prohibits you from advertising, people still put it on Facebook. I'm sure you've seen many times people posting on Facebook about a deal. Now that might be a 506C, so it might be okay, but a lot of times I know for a fact these are 506B deals that they're advertising. And the reason it's tricky, uh, John, is because Advertising doesn't just mean you talk about your deal specifically. It doesn't just mean, hey, I've got a hundred unit apartment building, I'm raising a million bucks, call me. That's obviously a advertising, that's fine. Anything that what's called conditions the market, meaning anything that drums up excitement about your deal, even if it's not direct, maybe it's an indirect pumping up, that also can be considered an offer and therefore potentially advertising. And that's the one I see where people are really violating the most. And my, my favorite example is, a lot of people like to get on social media when they're doing their due diligence and their walkthrough in their apartments or whatever. And so they may not specifically say they're raising money for this particular apartment, but it's very clear from the way they're talking or maybe the hashtags they put at the bottom that, you know, hey, I'm open for business. And if you're interested in, in, in investing, you know, give me a call uh, because they're just trying to get trying to get people excited about that. So um, that's probably the number one thing. It's just it's just hard because. It's just, it's, it's, there's a lot of gray area. Let's, let's be honest. That's, that's one of the things that's really hard. I mean, pitching your deal directly is clearly not allowed, but you know, con what, what is conditioning the market, right? It's, it's just, it's, it's a little bit of a gray area. So which is one of the reasons I typically recommend staying off social media. If you have an active deal going, um, it's just not, I don't think it's the, it's the right time to go look for new people. It's a private offering anyway, so you shouldn't be on there anyway. And it's really in between deals that you should be trying to add to your list and, and you, you know, it's probably the best time to, to, to find new people is when you don't have a deal anyway, because there's no pressure, but that's when you should be going to meetups and trying to meet people or going on social media. And when you go on social media, you really need to limit yourself to two things. One, factual information about you and your business. So nothing wrong with talking about, you know, 
you, you personally or Kronos or, or whatever the, the company might be. Factual information is fine. And then my favorite is value add, right? Put content out there that's really valuable to your end consumer. If, you're, if your end consumer is an investor who might be you know, a doctor or a busy professional, they don't have time and, and, and you wanna convince them to, to, to get in the, in the game of real estate or, or passive investments, you know, write an article on why real estate is the greatest asset class ever invented for wealth creation or why the, the market of Houston, Texas is the, the hot and upcoming market and you should really, and just do a report or a webinar or something of value that you can then get in, you know, in exchange for an email or, or, or a phone number or whatever so you can communicate with them. Um, and that's a, that's a legitimate way of getting their contact information. Now, that doesn't mean I can pitch them a deal, right? Because the general rule is you must have what's called a pre-existing substantive relationship with your investors, right? And in order to have that, I have to have that relationship prior to the deal. It's a pre-existing relationship, meaning pre-existing to my deal. So I, if I do capture somebody from, from one of these techniques, or I meet somebody at a meetup, or I go to a conference and I get somebody's business card, all good, you can't offer them any current deals. You have to get into a relationship with them, a substantive relationship, and once you get into that relationship, you can then offer them a future deal. So that's kind of the, I don't know there's a lot in there, but that's kind of the, the mistake that I think people make when they're doing primarily 506B, because again, if you're doing a 506C, knock yourself out. You can use social media, you know, and that's one of my favorite arguments as, as to why not, why not do a 506E, because then you can go on social media and advertise. Or obviously, if you do a Reg A+, plus and you've got your offering approved by the SEC, then you could also obviously go on social media. But if you're doing 506B, which I would say is about 90% of the people, right? 90% of people probably rely on, on 506B, then advertising is a prohibition. It's one of those items that we talked about at the beginning. You cannot advertise and you cannot generally solicit either. You can't go to a conference or a meetup and start passing out your business plans to people you don't know, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's meant to be a private offering with people you already have relationships with. So why would you be on Facebook when you, you don't have relationships with those people? So how do I know if I have a... So I wanted to go into... Good. Um, so I wanted to go into the relationship uh, part of it. What... What determines a pre-existing relationship and how can you prove that to the SEC? Great question. This is an area where it's one of the few areas where we have some guidance from the SEC. So the SEC has given us a lot of guidance on this and essentially has come up with like, I think it's six or seven things or factors or things you should be doing in order to take somebody from a complete stranger, i.e. You, you got somebody off Facebook or you met somebody at a conference all the way through establishing a substantive relationship. Um, and I think actually this, I did a, a, face, uh, a Facebook, I did a YouTube video on this, which was really popular because this is a, a question a lot of people have. And so there's generally about six or seven steps, but the main one is sending the individual at some point a really detailed questionnaire. What you're trying to do, by the way, you're trying to get to know this person well enough that you can determine whether this is a suitable investment for them. Do they have... Uh, the sufficient knowledge and expertise to evaluate the merits and the and the risks of your deal. That's what you're trying to accomplish. So the ways you do that is you send them a questionnaire really detailed, like, are you accredited? How much do you make? Have you invested in, uh, have you invested in syndications before? How, you know, how liquid are you? What's your level of experience? Like all these questions that are meant to really figure out their level of sophistication. That, that's number one. That's one right off the bat. In fact, I, that's probably the first thing I would do. The second thing is you want to get on a phone call with them or a, a lunch or a coffee or whatever, but a one-on-one -on -one interaction with them where you get to, again, you're talking to them, right? You're probably talking about whatever they put in their questionnaire. They're asking questions of you. You're asking questions of them. Again, you're just generally fostering that, that thing. The SEC is very clear that there's no magic timeline. There's no magic touches. So it's not 30 days. It's not three touches. Uh, it's the quality of the interactions that matter. And it's your burden to prove that. So you want to make sure you're keeping a very uh, tight uh, record of all this. So if it's a questionnaire, obviously you can keep that on your computer. I've had clients who will literally with, with the permission of the other person, you know, record the conversation that they have. So again, if somebody asks you seven years from now, Hey, you, how did you get to, you know, how did, when did you figure out that Mauricio was, you know, you had a substantive relationship? Well, I talked to him. I sent him a questionnaire on March 16th. We had two phone calls and by the way, here's the recording. So you can see, you know, we can transcribe them or you can, or you can take really good notes or whatever, but you've got to be able to prove it. 
And so you've got to keep really good records. Uh, and again, just emailing back and forth and, you know, website, encouraging them to look at the website. You could also, you could actually talk to them at that point about your current offering. You could be like, look, here's the current offering that we have. I can't, I can't offer it to you, but it at least gives you an idea of the type of, you know, philosophy we have or the type of deals we do. So, you know, and you're, and you're welcome to ask questions. So all these factors, these six or seven factors that come in, at some point you will say, you know what, I feel pretty good about this. Uh, I, I feel like today, whatever the day is, I have a substantive relationship with Mauricio. And again, that doesn't allow you to pitch the deal to me today. It allows me to pitch a future deal to me at that point. So it's just really important to keep good records so you don't start emailing me deals before we have that substantive relationship. And so you said there's two ways you're seeing people raise money illegally. What's the second one? The other way is paying money to paying, paying people to raise money for you. Uh, this is something I've been harping on for a while now, probably over a year now, and so especially on social media. But, you know, especially when you get into bigger and bigger deals, uh, it gets harder and harder to raise the money. So you may be able to raise a million dollars or two million dollars, but if you need to raise five, then people have sometimes have a, have a hard time doing that. And so it's very tempting to bring in, you know, John or Fritz who, you know, can maybe help me out with my deal, but really they have a huge, Hey, look, you guys have a podcast. You can easily, you know, get people uh, into our deal. So, Hey, why don't we partner? Um, and I'll pay you in order to bring in your people into my deal. And the problem there lies is that the general rule is you, you cannot get compensated for raising money unless you're a broker dealer, which nobody is. I mean, not nobody, but in our world, nobody's a broker dealer. And so you have to fit into one of these, exemptions again these are called issuer exemptions because when you're issuing the security yourself you're not raising money for other people you're raising money for yourself so most people will fit into an issue exemption again this is just stuff that people don't think about right they they just they just don't it's just not part of they shouldn't have to think about that's what their lawyers are for and this, this is why you want to talk to a lawyer because there's a lot of things out there that you may not think about that the lawyer is doing in their in their head in the back of their head they're doing the checklist to make sure nothing nothing's popping up but every so often one of these things does pop up and then you bring it to the forefront and so the way you really are able to get compensated, it's not really getting compensated for raising the money, you're getting compensated for, for bringing value to the syndication. So if you bring a legitimate, so let's say the two of you, let's say the two of you are partners and you're doing a syndication and you bring in Mauricio because he's in California, let's just, let's just dream a little bit and say you're gonna buy a property in Southern California. <laughs> uh, and you're like, well, hell, I don't know anything about Southern California. I know it's a great market and I want to invest in it, but I don't, I don't have anybody boots on the ground, but hey, Mauricio's down there. He has all these relationships. He has relationships with brokers, with property managers. He knows the market really well. Let's bring Mauricio in to help us with the syndication and, and manage the asset and do all this work, help us underwrite and find deals. And incidental, incidental to that, Mauricio's got a big audience, so obviously I can then open it up to my world but I'm not getting compensated for bringing in my people. I'm getting compensated for doing all the work just like you guys are. And the thing that I've seen a lot lately is like in the old days, it would literally be one person do a, doing a syndication or maybe like you guys, it'd be two people or three people, you know, maybe like that. But now I'm seeing five and six and seven and 10 people, these what we call co-sponsors into this deal where inevitably one or two of them aren't really doing much work. They're literally there because they have the ability to go raise money and bring that money into the deal. And this has been a concern of mine for many, many, many years, but I've really been vocal about it over the last 12 months. Uh, and I always thought that we had to wait until something like what's going on now, where you get a market turn or a shift where people start losing money. Cause that's when all this, this is when all, everything goes down is, is when people start losing money, that's when the investors pick up the phone and complain. When everything's going great, you could violate all the rules in the world. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. when things start to turn that's when things but in fact even before this this um and we're obviously taping this during a coronavirus uh pandemic even before this we found out that the sec has now been paying attention to and is investigating folks who are doing this they're bringing in people or allegedly bringing in people uh who really aren't contributing much to the deal other than bringing in the capital and when that happens you're essentially acting as an unlicensed broker dealer which is problematic for the broker dealer who doesn't have a license because they're practicing without a license. But more importantly for me, the syndicator, my clients, the person who's really raising the money, they're not disclosing, obviously, they're not disclosing to the investors that they're paying this, this person who's not a licensed broker because that's a disclosure you would make. There's nothing wrong with using brokers, but if you do use brokers, you, you have to disclose that information to the investors. And so that's a failure to disclose, which now falls into this illegal category because 
one of the things that you are required to do when you do raise all this money, which is a whole other area we haven't gone into, is there are all these disclosures we have to provide the investors, a PPM, a private placement memorandum, you know, operating agreements, subscription agreements, there's a whole package of disclosure documents. And that would be a number one, not a number one, but a main disclosure is if you are using a broker dealer, you would want to disclose who that broker dealer is and how much you're paying them. And obviously when you're doing this, you're not disclosing that. Are you struggling to understand how to underwrite multifamily properties? Hi, I'm John Stober, and I completely understand your problem. I thought underwriting would come naturally to me due to my background in finance and accounting, but I quickly found out that there aren't a lot of resources that cover this subject. I had no idea whether what I was doing was right, wrong, or just original. I don't want you to have to pick up little nuggets here and there like I did, so I wrote an ebook called how to analyze big apartment buildings and make them feel small that puts together all the pieces of the puzzle. We're also giving away a deal analyzer with the ebook and they're both completely free. Don't wait as long as I did to start chasing financial freedom. Go to bit.ly forward slash underwriting ebook and get your free copy today. So, being just a capital raiser is, is definitely a, a no-no, right? So what, what are some other jobs that these capital raisers can have that the SEC recognizes as you're adding value to the syndication? I wouldn't call them capital raisers because when you start calling them capital raisers, you're already, you're already losing. Uh, so <laughs> you, you, they're not necessarily jobs. They're doing the same type of work that you guys are doing. You're, you're, you know, you're underwriting deals, you're doing research on the market, you're doing due diligence, you're walking the units, you're talking to the lawyers, you're hiring the property managers, you're asset managing. That's probably the biggest one. Like if you can show, that's why the boots on the ground is such a great one. If you can show somebody is really managing the asset or managing the relationships, most people will hire a property manager, but that actually day-to-day -day managing, that's a huge one. Um, investor relations and all that stuff as well. But, you know, it has to be, you have to be doing some work, you know, after the raise is done. Like when you think of the raise being done, you guys don't go home. It's not like, you. Just, oh, great. We've raised the money. We've closed on the property, <laughs> champagne on ice, and, and we go home. And that's when the real work starts, right? So, so, so what are they doing? You want to make sure they're doing something in that asset management. And, and you know, investor relations certainly would count. Um, but again, it's not just you know, forwarding a report, you know, somebody has to put together, obviously, as you guys know, put together the quarterly reports, figure out the distributions to people, answer the phones when people have questions or complaints or, hey, I didn't get my K-1. And you're like, oh, that <laughs> sometimes a little bit of a nightmare. That, that's who your investor relations person is. So certainly that would be one of the one of the rules. But asset management would be great. But just anything that doesn't look like we close on the offering, we raise all the money, and then this person disappeared and got compensated you know, it's going to look a little bit thing. And the key words, by the way, there's two key words in the statute. Um, uh, and that is, uh, they have to be doing uh, substantial work. So that's a little bit fuzzy, like what does substantial mean, but it's got to be real work substantial. It can't just be, you know, grabbing coffee for, for John. Uh, and their primary, their primary role must be something other than raising money. And so to me, primary just means 50% or more. So what are you spending your time on? And just make sure that more than half of your time was spent doing substantial work not raising the money. So let's say I find a deal and I raise a bunch of money and then I'd make some posts on social media, the deal closes and I make a few hundred thousand dollars. Is the SEC going to scrutinize my level of compensation and say, well, for how much work you did, like you could have hired a virtual assistant in the Philippines for six bucks an hour. I think, you know, I, I, I've made that argument before. I do think that, you know, a lot of people like to say, look, I'm an investor relations guy like that's my role and you know sometimes you have like five or six different investor relations persons which is a problem but let's just assume you have one investor relations guy if they end up like you said if they end up getting two three four five hundred thousand dollars for that role when you i don't think you have to go to the philippines you can get an investor relations person for sixty thousand dollars a year the question becomes it's not that it's automatically one strike and you're out but that's just not a good fact in your favor so if, if that's not a good fact in your favor you better show a bunch of other facts in your favor meaning they didn't just do investor relations. They also did this. They also maybe were KP or they only you know, the other activities that they did other than just being purely in investor relations because, and it also depends how much money they brought in, right? It's all facts and circumstances and it's a sliding scale. The more money this person brought in, the more scrutiny they would face on the amount of compensation they're getting for that particular role. If they didn't bring up, any, for example, if they didn't bring in any money 
and you wanted to pay this person 200 grand, then I would say that's a non-issue because there's, there's no way somebody would argue that they're getting compensated to raise money because they didn't, they didn't bring any of their own people in. Right? So it's all, it's all a sliding scale in, in facts and circumstances, which is again, part of the frustration for a lot of people because uh, what, what the SEC is generally focused on in the past has been the compensation side and whether the compensation has been tied to the success of raising the money. It's called transaction-based compensation. So that's most of our case law and no action letters have to do with transaction-based compensation. There isn't a ton on the substantial piece, but I think for me, what I was always worried about is, you know, I was joke about, you know, you know, my car has no front license plate, right? And my car has tinted windows. I, other than the first week, I never get pulled over for tinted windows. I certainly don't get pulled over for having no front license plate. But if I get a parking ticket, they're going to add that front license plate violation when they do that. I think something similar with this too, they may not necessarily, that might not be the lead reason they get you. But if somebody again complains and then they open up an investigation, that's when they're going to go through everything, right? They're going to ask, they're going to look at you at that point they're going to look at your social media or they're going to ask the investor look look if your investor lost money right they're going to ask the person like how did you hear about this deal like how much did you invest and the story's going to come out that hey i knew you know jose was my guy who i, I found this out from jose and then they're going to go who's this jose guy he doesn't seem to be really involved that much and it's, it's going to be they're going to find out once they open up the investigation i don't think they're going to go direct um with that but that's that's my chief concern is 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 once the audit opens up and there's an investigation that's when uh when we're seeing that right now there's really an active sec that we know that there's an active investigation going on and that's what they're looking at they're looking at the way they got compensated and whether you know they did substantial work or whether they you know primarily were raising money so i heard i've heard of this technique called a fund of funds though yeah, it's something that uh, people who raise money do to start their own syndications. Could you elaborate on what that is? Yeah, it's a great it's a great way if done properly to kind of alleviate some of these concerns that people have. Like if you are legitimately a money raiser, right? Um, meaning that's your, that's really what you're doing is raising the money. Then what you could do, which has other complications, but the general thesis is you could create your own syndication. So instead of me partnering with John and Fritz. I'll create my own syndication. I'll raise money into my deal. I'll structure it in compliance with whatever 506B, 506C, Reg A, whatever I want to do. I raise the money into my fund. And then I, with the sole purpose, I'm going to invest that money into your fund, into your deal, right? So I'm just going to be an LP, just like everybody else. I'm just going to happen to be a huge LLC with a million or 2 million bucks. And I'm going to be one investor for you. And I'm going to be contributing that into your LP. Where it gets tricky is number one, when you invest in somebody else's deal, you're now investing in securities as opposed to real estate. And so that makes you kind of a de facto investment advisor. And so you just need to make sure you check with your state to make sure there's no requirement that you register as an investment advisor in that particular state. So that's issue number one. Uh, and then issue number two is just, you gotta be careful with, with again, what we call disguised commission. You wanna make sure that the syndicators getting paid from their own fund, not somebody else is paying the fund and then that money's making its way into my pocket when essentially it's just de facto the, the, the other person's paying me a fee to raise money. So you just wanna make sure you structure it properly, but that there's a lot of value that you bring as a fund syndicator because a lot of folks, as you know, that's the whole point, is people are busy. You know, you have busy professionals, they have, they have money, but they don't have time. And so when you come along and you handle a lot of the due diligence, right, not only on the investment itself, but on the people running it, uh, and you handle the due diligence for them, then it makes sense that you get compensated for, for that work. Um, and then a lot of times these deals have high minimum investment. So there might be a really sweet deal. I was having a conversation this morning with a client. There might be a really sweet deal out there that, you know, I'd love to get in, but the minimum is 250 grand. Like I don't have 250 grand but your fund allows me to get in for maybe 50 grand minimum, and, but that I can invest through your fund. And so again, you're just trying to figure out ways to add value because ultimately, again, you don't wanna be getting compensated for raising the money, you wanna be compensated for adding value to whoever it is that you're, you're providing value to. So let's talk about the day-to-day -day of what goes into issuing a PPM. Like what happens from the time that I send an LOI out and it's accepted to the time that the property closes? How are you working with your SEC attorney through that entire process? Yeah, great question. So 
On the security side, so there's typically you're working with both a real estate attorney and a securities attorney. Those are two separate lawyers. We happen to have them in house under the one same roof. A lot of a lot of times they're two separate firms, but we have them all under one roof. But it's, I like to get involved early. So as soon as you're in an LOI, I typically have clients reach out to me. They retain us, and you start the process of putting together your business plan. Right? People call it an executive summary, a pitch deck. It's basically a business plan, meaning. I'm gonna go raise $2 million and I'm gonna do something with it, right? I'm gonna go buy this property, I'm gonna fix it up, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and then in two years we're gonna sell. Whatever that looks like, that's your business plan, right? Uh, and so my job is to take that business plan, really take a good look at it and make sure I basically underwrite every deal because my job as the attorney is to understand your deal so I can recognize what the risks are, not only of your deal in general, but your specific deal. Like how can this thing, <laughs> all the ways your deal can go south, and making sure we're disclosing everything, right? So if you are, for example, using a broker, which is fine, I need to be able to find that out. So my job is really to pull, it's like pulling teeth. I'm really having conversations with people and, and reading their business plan and pulling out all the information because all of that information goes into this private placement memorandum, which is a risk disclosure document. And that's my job. My job is to figure out what the risks are in your deal and put those in this PPM. Uh, and the PPM is kind of like a if you've never seen one before, it's like a medical consent form, right? When you go to the doctor and you have a procedure done, a surgery or something even minor, you're going to get a yellow sheet. It's called a medical consent form. All the ways your procedure can go wrong from nausea, vomiting, uh, you know, whatever, to death. Like it, literally you could die from this five-minute procedure. And that's what a PPM is. It just discloses all the way your deal can go wrong, number one. And then all the, you know, information about the sponsors and just anything that would be material, meaning any piece of information that an investor would take that would influence whether they they can make an intelligent decision, whether it's going to influence me on whether to make the decision or not. So that's that's what the attorney would do. Once we understand your deal, we'll obviously figure out what exemption we're going to rely on, and that's why I like people to reach out to you early. You want to reach out to your attorney early because that's when you're going to decide what exemption you're going to rely on, and that's going to determine what steps you can and cannot do along the way, along the timeline, right? So if you call your lawyer at the end of the process where you say, "Well, I've kind of raised all the money." I just need you to draft some documents and paper it. Well, maybe you've already put your stuff on Facebook and so you wanted to do a 506B because you've got some non-accredited, but it's too late. At that point, you cannot rely on that exemption because you've blown it for some reason. So you want to get in front of your lawyer early. They'll draft all the docs and um, you know, this all happens parallel, right? You're the SEC lawyers finding the exemption, putting the docs together and, and getting all that ready for the investor, setting up the bank accounts and the entity structuring. And at the same time, you're working your, with your real estate attorney you know, with the purchase and sale agreement and then having them, you know, negotiate with the lender and the title and all that stuff that all happens concurrently. Uh, my work typically gets done first because you can't raise a dime without me being done. <laughs> so we have to do all of our work and get all of our documents done because the investor cannot give you money until they've reviewed all the documentations and signed off. They've got to sign the docs. Uh, and obviously they can't do that until the attorney does it. And so then you're off to the races and you're raising money and the timeline continues, you know, working, your real estate attorney continues to work with the lender, gather all the documents that, that the lender's requiring you to close. Uh, and then everything kind of meets up at the end uh, where you have uh, your closing. And then once you close on the SEC side, the last piece of it is even though I said at the beginning that we don't have to worry about the states, I kind of lied a little bit. There's a little, little thing you have to do with the states. And we do have to give them a notice filing. So we do have to take a form. This is called a form D. If you're doing a, a 506B or 506C, you would do a form D. You'd file that with the SEC and then you'd file a, file a copy of that with all of the states, just letting them know what you're up to. That has to happen within 15 days, one five of that first sale. So there's a little bit of kind of uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, and I did lie a little bit because you, you, there is still anti-fraud provision. So you can't, you can't be Bernie Madoff and not expect the states to do something about it. But assuming you're not uh, committing fraud or anything like that, then the states really don't have much to say other than uh, requiring this notice, uh, which is a fairly simple document. So does that mean I can't actually collect any money from my investors until I've given them that PPM? Correct. Correct. Because that's, you have to provide them with the disclosures at the time of this. Remember, you're selling securities. Mm -hmm. So at the time of the sale, which would be obviously if they gave you money, uh, in exchange for, I'm not sure exactly what you'd be giving them at that point, but at the point they send you money, that would be the, the sale of the security. And you have not provided, if it's required, you have not provided them with any of the disclosure documents. So that has to precede them wiring money into your, you know, into your operating account. Mm -hmm. 
So then as far as entity structuring goes, I know a lot of these companies, they have like a branding company, like we're Kronos Investment Partners. Yeah. yeah. But each property j- tends to have its own LLC. What's the most common type of entity structuring that you form? Uh, we use LLCs. I mean, um, it, w- the nice thing about LLCs is most people forget this. You know, I used to do asset protection and I used to be an asset protection lawyer. So I, I'm really you know, well-versed in this, but LLCs are great because they maximize your asset protection and they can, they have the flexibility of being taxed however you want to be taxed. Mm -hmm. So you can have an LLC taxed as a C corp if that's for some reason you want to do that. You can have an LLC taxed as an S corp. You can have an LLC taxed as a partnership and you can have an LLC disregarded as if it's just you, you could actually have it disregarded so it doesn't even show up as a separate entity. So, but from an asset protection standpoint, a limited liability company does just that. It limits your liability. So every single syndication would have its own LLC that would own the property and would have all the investors come in, right? So that's the typical structure. You have an LLC typically set up in the state wherever your property is located. So if you're buying something in Houston, Texas, you would have a Texas LLC own the property and all your investors would come into that Texas LLC. And then you'd have a manager, right? An LLC has a manager, just like a corporation has a board of directors or has a president and a vice president, LLC has managers. That's the controlling party. And so that's usually an entity. Uh, and again, we, that's also a discussion. I, I prefer them as LLCs. And then for tax purposes, they're typically taxed as an S corp or a C corp, but that would also be an LLC. And most of the time in your scenario, it's not the only way to do it, but in most of the time they would have Kronos, for example, would be the manager of the syndication, what I call the syndication LLC. But I have seen it where Kronos is sort of the brand and kind of the, 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 the brand behind it, but some people actually create a separate management company for each syndication as well. So maybe this is called, uh, you know, the Houston, Texas LLC. Then I may create the Houston, Texas management LLC, right? Uh, that's specific to that deal. And there's various reasons to do that. But uh, that's your typical structure is you have a syndication LLC that owns a property and a management LLC that own, that manages it. And then you guys, you know, as owners typically would have another, a third LLC to, to house your, your, whatever your carried interest is, uh, your ownership percentage that you've decided to take on the, on the property. And so I've heard that when, if you're doing a 1031 exchange into a syndication, you typically do something called a, a tick, a tenant in common. Can that cause any complications when you're raising money? It, it, it requires a completely different structure. Like you mentioned, it requires the incorporation of a TIC, a tenants in common structure, meaning you know, when you're doing a 1031, let's just say I've got a property and I'm selling it and I'm going to have a $500,000 capital gain and I want a 1031. I have to, if I own that property in my personal name, I have to own the new property, the one that you're raising money for in my personal name. I can't own it through your LLC, right? And so I have to take title personally, but that doesn't work for you because you, you, you have an LLC and you have all these other investors. So how do we do it? The way we do it is we create basically my $500,000 would own, I'm making it up, but let's say I own 10% of the property directly. I have 10% ownership in that property. And then your, your LLC that's raising all the money would have the remaining 90%. So we'd actually have two owners of the property, the LLC, the syndication LLC, and then the, the individual or, or the 1031 person. Um, and then that would all be tied together with a TIC agreement, a tenants in common agreement, whereby we agree to, to follow whatever rules we have. What you've got to be careful about there, though, is there are some tax rules and regulations that you have to follow on a TIC in order not to blow your 1031 exchange. So it's very important to make sure you've got a really great CPA, not only for yourself, but also that, you know, obviously you want to get a sign off on the 1031 you know, the investor CPA who's doing the 1031. And ideally, there's always, always a 1031 intermediary making sure that they're signing off on the structure. But that's how we would typically do it. Uh, there are some limitations, you know, in terms of um, the way you distribute monies from that TIC. There's some rules about that, meaning it has to sort of follow ownership. So you, you can't take, you can't just uh, do a preferred return, for example, over the entire TIC. Um, and, and you just got to do everything sort of proportionally. So it, it gets a little bit tricky and there's some creative things that we can do, but you always want to make sure you're bringing in your CPA at that point, because if you, if you misstep there, the danger is that the, the, the investors 1031 might be blown, which means they're now on the hook for a tax, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollar tax bill. And if you didn't properly disclose that to you know, that investor, then you may have some issues there as well. So I want to make sure I have some language in the, 
disclosure document in the PPM that says something to the effect of, you know, we think this will work, but we make no representations. Go check with your CPA to make sure that, you know, they're okay with this thing. Uh, and in fact, I, I often like to have a, a, some kind of a written communication from their CPA just signing off and saying, yeah, I've reviewed your structure and I'm good with it. That's kind of a, a good uh, CYA for the, for the syndicator. So I wanted to kind of ask a, a different question. Um, how does it work when you're raising money from investors who don't live in the United States? What complications come with that? There's a lot of complications. Let's say complicated. There's a lot of issues that you've got to think about, right? Uh, let's go with in no, in no particular order. Number one, the SEC generally doesn't care about foreign investors, right? They're here to protect U.S. persons and U.S. citizens and U.S. residents, people in the U.S. So if you go raise a bunch of money from people in Europe, the SEC is really not going to care. And in fact, there's a specific exemption. You know, we talked about 506B and 506C. That's under what we call Reg D. We talked about Reg A. There's actually a Reg S as in SAM that covers you for international. So if all of your raise happens internationally, there's no marketing in the US, there's no selling in the US, you just got a bunch of people in Europe because that's where you're from or Asia, or today I had a call with folks in Dubai, then we don't worry too much about the US. You have to worry about the state securities laws in whatever country you're raising the money from, which I have no idea about, but that's one thing that you could do. The other issue you've got to be aware of is from a tax perspective, you have withholding requirements. So again, very important to be working with a CPA. So if somebody from overseas wires you 100 grand and you now are trying to wire them 10 grand back as their distribution, you have an obligation to withhold 30% of that distribution uh, and file a form and send it, I believe it's the Treasury Department, um, and, and that's a 30% withholding tax with the idea that they would, they would have to, you know, forcing them to file a tax return to get some of that money back. But uh, if you don't do it, you might be on the hook for that. If, if, if you didn't withhold the 30% and they ended up not paying the tax, you might be on the hook for that. So it's, again, important to work with a CPA. The other issue that pops up specifically with Canada, but I know it, it, there's other countries as well, um, just make sure that the country that the investors are coming from recognize your entity form. So for example, we, we were talking about LLCs. We use LLCs. Canada doesn't recognize, they don't know what an LLC is. So in Canada, if you invest in an LLC, it, def it defaults to a corporation. So now you get double tax. So if that's not discussed with the investor or the investor doesn't know, they're not really happy come tax time when they realize that their returns are cut in half because of the tax consequences. So there's ways that we can structure it to alleviate that problem. But again, there's, you know, I know that in Germany, there's some, some forms in Germany that we don't recognize. In Mexico, there's a couple of uh, entity forms, SAs that we don't have. So just it recognize that each country has different rules and regulate, uh, sorry, different entity structures that we want to make sure that all works together. And then the last thing I would bring up, which I don't really have a great answer for, but there's also anti-money laundering statutes that you got to make sure, just be aware of, you know, you want to make sure that you know these people that the money's coming in from, you know, if you're coming through a U.S. banking system, there's always an intermediary bank, a large financial institution, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, one of the big boys, um, then they're going to do their due diligence as well. Uh, that's part of what they're doing. But um, just be cognizant of that. I have heard some horror stories, especially with large amounts of money, where you know money comes in and they put a hold on it. There's you know there's all kinds of uh, regulatory bodies in the U.S. that can literally go in and say, wait a minute, there's five million bucks that came in from Iraq. I don't know why I said that. I probably shouldn't have brought up a specific country. I didn't mean anything by it. Uh, I swear. But you know, and then they don't know where it comes from, and so they can literally freeze it while they they do their investigation and their due diligence, and it might take them two weeks. And in the meantime, you've got a closing on Monday. And you need the five million bucks. And so, again, if there's a big amount of cash coming in, I would recommend calling the bank. Hopefully, you have a relationship with the banker and just let them know, give them the heads up, it's coming. What information do they need in order to make this as smooth as possible? Do you need a passport? Do you need whatever? But stay in front of it because otherwise, you're, it's not a good idea to come after the fact and saying, hey, there's five million dollars that hit your account that I want. And it turns out that the government's taking it because they're doing due diligence on it. Awesome. Well, Mauricio, we're running up on time so i wanted to get to our section of the show that we call the fast five and these are the same five questions we ask every guest that comes on uh -oh. our show okay so question number one if you had to go back in time into your early 20s how would you uh, how would you start over how would you do that i would buy i would start investing in real estate sooner rather than later i would have done it right away i would have bought real estate and waited as opposed to wait and buy real estate very good answer 
Um, question number two, how do you see young professionals adding the most value to someone like yourself? Well, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Um, we can't, we're worthless millennials. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to, you know, that's a great point. You know, it's important to recognize that everybody, you know, you may even think that there's nothing you can add value to, but until you talk to that person, you know, like for, I'll give you an example. I'm an aspiring guitar player. Like I'd love to learn the guitar and I'm starting to learn. And so, you know, maybe you have some, it doesn't have to be specific to what you're doing, right? You can add value in so many different ways. So, uh, cause I always think of that on the flip end. Like if I'm talking to, you know, Richard Branson, not that I've talked to him lately, but if I'm going to talk to <laughs> Richard Branson, like obviously I'm not going to offer financial advice or a loan or whatever, but you know, maybe he has a charity, you know, that he's really passionate about. And if I support his charity, that might be something that's a win for him and you know, whatever. So just, just be open-minded and, and not just, don't just focus on, the specific real estate or, you know, financial thing, have a conversation, try and figure out what their other interests are and, and, and approach it that way to add value. Awesome answer. So what's the biggest mistake you've made in your, uh, in your career and how have you since adjusted your business? My biggest mistake was being a, a single point failure in my business. So up until a couple of years ago, I was basically a solopreneur. I was doing all the work. Um, I, had, I had my practice and it's a long, long story, but I essentially got sick uh, and my income went to zero because I was in the hospital for six months. And so I was a single point failure. I was all good if I got hit by a truck and died, but if I got hit by a truck and didn't die, and was kind of lingering around, that would cause an issue. So what I did then obviously is as soon as I came out of it, I started putting together my team. So it's been now about a year and a half now. And so I've grown my team to the point where if it happens again, if something happens where I'm out of commission for a long period of time, I've got a team behind me that can, that's already doing the work anyway. So it would almost, it would probably be better. <laughs> It'd be a seamless transition, but that's probably the biggest mistake is, is putting things off because I actually wrote a book about it behind me, one of the two behind me, but um, don't put things off. Like you've got, you know, especially if you're a millennium, like, you know, you, there's things that you are procrastinating about and you always think there's a tomorrow and you can do it tomorrow or the next day or the next day for us older folks it's always you know oh i gotta do that will that trust or you know get my in order but i'll do it tomorrow I'll do it tomorrow uh, and there may not be a tomorrow there might be a, a breakup in those plans so just don't procrastinate get things done but that's probably the biggest mistake uh, which i've since rectified definitely feel the procrastination uh i got like a thousand emails <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, question number four, what's, the, what's been your favorite way to incorporate technology and social media into your business? Well, I'm, as you probably know, it's probably how you ended up finding me is I made a conscious decision about a year and a half ago to, to add value through social media, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, podcast, um, and it's been a life changer. Um, I'm getting to the point now, well, now I'm forced to do it, but I was literally getting to the point where I'm cutting back on my physical travel you know, I'm asked a lot to speak at conferences and things like that. And those are great, but it, you know, I've got two kids at home. I want to spend more time with them. So hitting the plane, you know, I don't know how many miles, I mean, I'm up to not quite at a million mile level on American, but I'm, I'm getting there. So I've just made the transition to add value through social media and educate folks uh, about this and teach them online as opposed to, I mean, I still do it physically, but that's been a, a huge thing for me because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's helped me scale my business and it allows me to, to meet way more people and, and make it feel like we know each other, even though we've never met. Mm -hmm. Go social media. All right. So last question, what book has been most influential to you on your journey? Wow. Most influential in so many books. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki is probably the most influential. That's an interesting word that you use. Most people say, what's the best business book or what's the best this? So the most influential book for me was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, and um, so if, 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 if any of your listeners have not read that, I don't know what you're waiting for. That's, that's a mind shift for you. And I would highly recommend reading that book. Don't procrastinate. <laughs> yeah, don't procrastinate. Don't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Well, awesome. Mauricio, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. If any of our listeners wanted to reach out with you or get in touch, uh, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can, you know what, w website, premierlawgroup.net. Uh, you can reach me through that. I've got a YouTube channel that people can check out. And um, if somebody wants to learn a little bit more about the social media, since I know millennials, you guys are all over that. Uh, I've got a five-part video series on uh, how to use social media to raise capital. Uh, and so if you email me at social 
at premierlawgroup.net, I'll automatically send you uh, send you that five part video series. So any of those would work. Boom, that is value right there. I love it. <laughs> All right, Marisha. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good one. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. See, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast, brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a written review at iTunes so that we can connect with more people. Finally, head on over to chronosinvestmentpartners.com and sign up for our newsletter so you can stay updated on everything we're doing. If you're interested in partnering with us as we find new opportunities, you can also schedule a phone call with us under the Contact Us tab at chronosinvestmentpartners.com.